We've got a really, really full program today. And obviously, we want to get all the information out to you as quickly and concisely as we possibly can, because we know that you're pretty busy these days, too. Hopefully, you got a little bit of rain, and I'm sure that'll be in our comments as we go through the next couple of hours. Some of us did pick up a nice shower overnight, us being me for the first time in probably uh, three weeks. I got more than uh, uh, a smattering in the bottom of the rain gauge. I, I was actually able to get in the back 40 at Richville. Uh, we got about four tenths of an inch, but some folks not even two miles away got nothing. But uh, hopefully you'll get a little bit of precipitation here over the next few days. Our, our weather forecast, is, I call it static. It's what you see today is what you're going to get for the next several days, sunshine, chance of showers, and uh, plenty of humidity. So it's uh, July weather on uh, June the 9th, and you are at a field day in air-conditioned comfort, hopefully, wherever you are. I'm Terry Henney with WSGW Radio, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Brian Horgan. Uh, Brian is the uh, MSU Plant, Soil, and Microbial Science Department Chair. Uh, Brian, good morning to you and uh, happy Wednesday. Yeah, happy Wednesday to you too, Terry. Thank you very much. I, um, uh, I love hearing all the weather updates. We did not get the rain down here. We got a little smattering here on campus. Um, so hopefully we, uh, like you said, start to get a little bit more and replenish the soil and, and uh, get our crops to harvest. So welcome to the uh, 2021 Virtual Wheat Field Day from all of us in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Sciences here at Michigan State University. Um, I am Brian Horgan, I'm a professor and chair here in PSM. And I would like to just start us off by thanking the Michigan Wheat Program for the support uh, for our research and extension programs, especially for uh, Dennis Pennington, our jointly funded wheat specialist, uh, Manny Singh, our agronomist, uh, Christy Sprague, our weed specialist, Marty Chilvers, our pathologist, uh, Kurt Steinke, fertility specialist, and Eric Olson, our wheat breeder and geneticist. Uh, we could not do what we do without your support and input related to uh, wheat uh, I also want to recognize, though, that the added support from the wheat, um, the Michigan Wheat Program for the Mason Farm, uh, you have been very gracious with your resources to help us modernize that space, um, and we are very grateful for that. So on behalf of MSU, I'm wishing you all a, a, a good field day uh, today, a virtual field day, and also a productive and safe uh, growing season. So with that, I am going to pass it off to Dave. Um, and Dave uh, Milligan, who, as you all know, is the um, current president of the National Association of Wheat Growers and will be your host for uh, the introductions of our speakers this morning. So thank you again. Thank you, Brian, and uh, welcome to all the participants we have. Uh, even though it is virtual, uh, you got to realize that uh, when this thing was put together that we had uh, the Restrictions were such that we could not count on being able to do it in person. So once again, we decided to do virtually. So that's, that decision had to have been made quite a while ago when it was. And we certainly need to thank, uh, especially Dennis Pennington and Jody for uh, all the work. It's, it's quite a bit of work to put these things together. But as we do have a good program, uh, we certainly want to, again, thank all the presenters that we've helped support with the Michigan Wheat Checkoff money with that. We will turn it over to Christy Sprague, and we're going to try to keep everything to 15 minutes. And so you have until 8.20, Christy. It's all yours. Thanks, Dave, and good morning, everyone. Um, today, I'm just going to kind of do a quick overview of some of the things you need to be considering when we're looking at weed control and winter wheat. Um, as you know, we're past the stage of really doing much weed, con or weed control right now. Uh, we do have some of those pre-harvest applications that if you end up running into problems, we have some of those recommendations that we can get to you um, at the end of the season. But what I thought I would do today is really touch on some of the key things that um, we look at as a MSU weed science program and trying to answer some of the, the big questions that you might have about weed control and wheat. Um, and really a lot of the stuff we've been doing is focusing on looking at control of particular species that becomes very difficult or can be very difficult to control 
as well as looking at some of those application timings. As we look at some of the herbicides that we have that we can use, can you, um, can you we have a, a, a wide range of um, application timings that we can use for some of these different um, herbicide applications and um, how effective some of these herbicides can be. And one of the other things that we've put a lot of work into is how certain practices may impact not only weed control, but as we start looking at planting more cover crops, either uh, with um, interseeding things like red clover or frost seeding or possibly planting after wheat harvest, how some of those herbicide applications can affect that. So again, this is really what we're doing in our uh, weed control program. And what I thought I would do first is really focus on um, highlighting some of the key problems that we see um, in winter wheat from, our, from the weed control standpoint. And I really wanna highlight three grasses at first. And we've talked about these a little bit in the past, but right now is a good time to really start scouting your fields and thinking about next year and um, what might be some of the issues coming up. And um, those of you that have attended our field days or some of the talks in the past have known that we put a lot of work into looking at rough stock bluegrass. Um, right now is a perfect time to scout for this weed. Uh, just driving back from the uh, Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center yesterday, uh, I saw several fields where we had this nice, nice bright golden weed that was above uh, the wheat, and that is rough stock bluegrass. So that's one of those ones that we want to be on the lookout for. Again, this is one that really shows up more in our wheat crop as well as it can be a problem in alfalfa. We don't usually see it in some of our other crops, but if you see it in your wheat, this is something you're going to want to be looking for um, next season in some of your other wheat fields. Another weed that uh, we see um, as a problem in wheat or we see it a lot in wheat is annual bluegrass. And this one is a winter annual. And this is one of the ones uh, right out of the gate. Well, you go out to your fields, a lot of times we see a lot of annual bluegrass. This was a particularly good annual bluegrass year. We see that it grows in clumps, but the one thing I do wanna point out, the big difference between rough stock bluegrass and annual bluegrass is where we can see rough stock bluegrass shooting way above that wheat crop. Um, annual bluegrass just really stays very small, usually about three, three inches, three to five inches tall, grows in clumps probably is not really that competitive with our wheat crop. So I know a lot of people get very concerned about it because it's one of those things that's out there early, you see it out there. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, it's probably not as much of a problem as some of the other grass problems that we see in winter wheat. The final one I wanna mention is uh, wind grass. This is one that has been a uh, traditional problem up in the thumb region of Michigan. Um, we do know that it is mostly a fall emerger, so some of those fall herbicide applications, and we'll talk about which ones are effective, um, can really um, help in controlling wind grass. And um, one of the things that we also see is probably in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to see a reddish panicle or that grass being above that wheat crop. So those are kind of the key, three key weeds, grass weeds that we deal with in winter wheat. While there are a couple others that are starting to show up, these are the ones that are the most prevalent. And one of the things I often get as a question is, well, how do we tell the difference between these things when they're um, first coming up in wheat? Because they do look a lot alike. Uh, the, the key thing to do is really to focus on um, what we call the ligule. You can see it here with the rough stock bluegrass. Excuse me, I'll go back. Um, and you can see that uh, long pointed ligule for rough stock bluegrass. If we're looking at something like annual bluegrass, we tend to see this kind of more rounded ligule. We'll also see these boat shaped uh, leaf tips. And then with wind grass, we see a long ligule, but it is also um, very jagged. So those are kind of the key things to look at um, as these things are really small. So you have an idea of what herbicides you may want to use to control them. So what herbicide options do we have to control some of these grass weed species? So right here we have the FEEK scale and I'm kind of trying to put you, give you an idea of what our time frame is as far as applications of some of these different grass herbicides. So when we look at these, um, we've got a couple that uh, have very good grass activity, Osprey and then Osprey Extra, which is a uh, newer premix. And they're both ALS inhibitors. 
Um, so these are both very effective on several of the grasses. And we can apply this in the fall all the way up to basically feet six, so six, so before jointing. Another herbicide that's very effective on grasses is PowerFlex. Um, usually we can apply this in the fall, but we want to wait till that wheat has three leaf. And again, that's got kind of a very similar uh, timing. And then one that's got a little bit wider application timing is Axial Bold, and that can go all the way up to pre-boot. And you'll see that that's a little bit different uh, herbicide site of action. These are the group one herbicides or the ACCAs inhibitors. So there's a little bit of differences in how effective some of these, we, um, these herbicides are for control of some of these key grasses. So when we look at this, we've done a lot of work looking at different applications, either in the fall, uh, early spring, which I would say would be about mid-April, uh, late spring or wheat, I would say would be that first part of May. And when we look at rough stock bluegrass, we have tended to find that really Osprey or Osprey Extra or an early application of Axial Bulb has been the most effective. So thinking about that for next year. Uh, annual bluegrass, um, we can get good control of annual bluegrass um, with either Os the Osprey products or PowerFlex, but uh, those applications really need to be made before the annual bluegrass is starting to flower. And that tends to be fairly early. Again, remember this wheat is probably not that competitive. Uh, once it puts its seed on, a lot of times it'll just kind of uh, die off and not really be a huge problem later in the season. Uh, with windgrass, we've also done a lot of work. We've had excellent control um, it, from fall applications for that particular herbicide. And then we can also get some early uh, good control or excellent control with uh, early spring applications. And again, all uh, mostly our ALS inhibitors, either Osprey or PowerFlex, are probably the most effective for that weed. So when you think about what weeds you have out there, you need to make sure that you're making the correct um, selection there. So when we think about the next set of weeds that we really run into issues is a lot of our winter annual weeds. And I would say chickweed is probably the one that's probably the most prevalent in many of our wheat fields. Um, also, we see a lot of henbit, purple net, dead nettle. Those were very uh, prevalent this year and some of the different mustard species, including yellow rocket. Um, other weeds that we tend to see in our wheat are uh, some of our summer or spring emergers, things like common ragweed and common lamb's quarters. We tend to see these more competitive when we have holes um, or drowned out areas in our wheat crop. Um, usually if we have a good wheat stand, that wheat can really outcompete uh, both of those weeds and they're not too much of a problem. One of the newer ones that we're really starting to see as more of an issue is um, horseweed or mare's tail. And we can see that come up in the fall. It can come up in the spring. It can come up in the summer. That's one of those ones that's um, becoming a huge problem because of its emergence pattern. And the other thing that we run into is a lot of resistance issues, particularly the ALS resistance that we see or group two resistance that we see. And um, when we start looking at what herbicides we have for weed control in wheat. And many of those populations are also resistant to glyphosate. So let's look at some of those more common broadleaf herbicides. Now we've got several others, but I just want to highlight a few that are probably most commonly used. So one of the ones that I'm um, going to talk about is Affinity Broad Spec. Again, this is one that can be applied in the fall, um, up basically up to that pre-boot stage. Uh, these are ALS inhibitors. So as I mentioned, a lot of our mare's tail or horseweed populations are ALS resistant. So probably not gonna be a very good herbicide for that. Um, we've got a newer one, Culex, which is a combination of not only an ALS inhibitor, but also a growth regulator. Um, that also can be applied in the fall, uh, basically up to the pre-boot stage. So we're getting some longer application windows on some of these. Two other ones, Husky and Talonor. I would say Husky is probably the one that's predominantly used on a lot of our acres in Michigan, um, a good wide range. Um, a lot of these herbicides really are most effective when the weed is up. So we're not getting a lot of residual control. So we tend to see these herbicides applied more in the spring. Uh, these have two different herbicide site of action groups. So we're getting a lot of different um, herbicides out there, not necessarily ones where we have a lot of resistance issues. Um, kind of a newer one that has uh, some more growth regulators like Stinger and Starine, as well as it's a, a premix with um, PowerFlex, so it does also have some grass activity. It's perfect match. It's got a little bit better um, application window, so we're really looking at making sure that that application goes on prior to joining. 
And then also just want to mention MCPA. And when we look at these herbicides, um, we see that there are a lot of weeds that they do control. But what I want to just kind of focus on are possibly some more of the weaknesses. And a lot of this information is in our weed control guide. But as you can see, um, where we have some of the more strengths, again, Husky is one of those ones where we use a lot of that in the state. Um, and it's because they do control a lot of those problem weeds that we have in Michigan. And we can also see that several of these other ones um, uh, have very effective control of some of those other weeds. And also just want to bring up over here, while we do get uh, good control, probably not as good as some of the other herbicides with um, on things like mare's tail and some of the uh, different mustard species. Um, MCPA is the one where we can apply it in the spring after we uh, frost seeded red clover. So if that's in your mix and you're looking for a spring herbicide, that's pretty much the only broadleaf herbicide that you can use. And then one other thing I just want to highlight is that we uh, do see very good horseweed or uh, tail control and chickweed control with basically Culex, Husky, Talonor, and Perfect Match. So we've got some good options out there. So what I want to just quickly talk about is some of the research that we're doing this year and really looking at how these herbicides can affect cover crops that we might plant after wheat harvest. And this is by far one of the uh, biggest questions I have is like, if I use some of these herbicides, what cover crop can I plant after um, using those after wheat harvest? So we've basically looked at this or are looking at this and we've got three locations. We've got the uh, location up the Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center up here by Richville, also on campus and then down at Kellogg Biological Station. And we're pretty much looking at those standard herbicides, ones that we feel would have some residual activity. And just want to highlight some of the things that we're seeing for this year. Um, this is our uh, Richville location up at the Saginaw Farm. And also at KBS, we didn't see any injury from any of the herbicides that we applied. So we've got these very long strips, replicated strips of these herbicides, haven't seen any injury. And that's one of the things that we're looking at in addition to how they're gonna affect the cover crops. But what we did see this year um, at East Lansing um, on campus, we did see that certain herbicides did injure wheat. And you can look at this overhead shot and you can see some of these yellow strips. So we're gonna focus in a little bit more on what that is. So when we look at um, some of these strips, you can see that we are seeing some yellowing and in some cases some stunning with some of these different herbicides. So this um, highlighted region here is an application of Affinity Broad Spec. We've got a couple highlighted regions over here, a little bit stunted, yellowed, Osprey Extra, and then PowerFlex, we're also seeing some of that yellowing. So when we saw, uh, went out there and did some visual eva evaluations, we see that Osprey Extra did cause the most injury, followed by PowerFlex and an Affinity Broad Spec. And these were our 14 day after treatment evaluations. Uh, we did see a little bit of reduction um, in that injury over time with both uh, Affinity Broad Spec and PowerFlex, but we are still seeing some Osprey Extra injury. And these are our ALS inhibitors. So again, here's untreated versus Osprey Extra. And you can see that is still even holding tr true through last week. So here's our untreated, and we are still seeing some stunning of Osprey Extra. And we're basically going to take these to yield and see what kind of impact that is. Again, uh, this is a premix that has Osprey and another ALS inhibitor. So we'll see how that all works out. So what caused that herbicide injury? Well, if you remember back when we were making herbicide applications, we had some differences in temperature. So here's where we had our uh, applications made for the Saginaw Valley. And we had some good temperatures, KVS. When we applied our uh, applications on campus, you can see we had some very cold nights and really very cold days. And as we talk about that, a lot of times we say, you know, we really got to be con conscientious of those cold temperatures because it can increase injury to uh, wheat. And we really did see that with the ALS inhibitors this year. So just a quick thing as we're finishing up is that um, that's one of the things that we really need to focus on. And that was one thing that really was very prevalent across the state, uh, making sure that those applications were made 
uh, when those temperatures, um, those daily temperatures are 50 degrees or higher. Um, and that's gonna really help alleviate some of the injury that we have seen from some of the ALS herbicides. And then just to mention, we will be planting nine different cover crop species uh, after we harvest wheat this year at all three locations. And we'll get a good idea of how those herbicides may affect those cover crop species. So stay tuned. And just wanna mention, we've got some different uh, things you can go to to look for more information on weed control and winter wheat. Our website, also we have a very good section in the MSU Weed Control Guide for Field Crops. And then we have a very good section in the new Michigan Wheat 101 Bulletin that was sent out this last year. So again, um, really wanna thank the Michigan Wheat Program for funding. Also wanna thank, thank Project Green for helping fund some of the um, cover crop work that we're doing uh, after wheat harvest. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thank you, Christy. Uh, very timely information, very well done. I see we have a couple questions that have been typed in the chat box. I should have mentioned that earlier. If you do have questions, please put them in there. And we do not have time to answer them right now. We've used up our time, but we will uh, maybe, um, Christy, if you can answer these, if you get a chance and if not, we'll put some of these in some of the future um, things that come out of the Michigan Wheat Program, the Wheat Wisdom or something like that. So, so thanks again, Christy. Now we're on to Manny Sprig. And he's going to talk about his wheat planting strategies. And Manny, you have until 8.35. So, all right. Away. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about uh, uh, the work we are doing on wheat planting uh, strategies, uh, along with uh, Dennis Pennington uh, and a couple of graduate students, uh, Calvin, who's finishing up his degree, and uh, Patrick, who's uh, just getting started here. Uh, so... The focus here uh, that, that we are pretty much uh, chasing is uh, how we can design an ideal canopy that can maximize that, uh, that light that can intercept through that canopy and increase the, the utilization of, of that light, right? That, that's gonna produce more sugars and uh, a higher grain yield. And as uh, we all know, there is no silver bullet here, right? Uh, to accomplish uh, a high yield potential. So we are looking at these uh, combination of strategies, mainly focused uh, on, on those planting time decisions, uh, because we know that we are setting up uh, uh, our yield potential at the planting time, right? And then we can uh, do our best to protect that, that, that potential. So in terms of our research, we have been spending a lot of time looking at uh, various planting methods with the goal of uh, improved seed placement that can result in uh, a higher strand establishment, right? Uh, factors in terms of seeding depth, seed spacing, uh, row spacing, uh, we have done a lot of work on that. And we are starting to dive more into uh, these questions on optimal seeding rates. Uh, what is the optimal planting time? What is the penalty if planting gets delayed? As we have seen with some of these uh, recent uh, adverse weather uh, scenarios and even variety selection, uh, uh, how does that fit in, in all of these components? So when we think about a planting target, generally what comes to mind is that how we can get to a uniform depth and spacing, right? Getting a better seed to, to soil contact, essentially this can lead to more uniform plant development uh, and tilling capability, both in terms of seeding depth, as you can see in this picture, and seed to seed spacing. And this can lead to again, more uniform plant as well as overall canopy development, right? And that can give us, uh, again, more uniform canopy, hopefully helping us with the management decisions. Fungicide application at flowering comes to mind, right? If the canopy is more uniform, hopefully the efficacy of that fungicide can be improved. And we have seen some, uh, some results that I will show over here. But we are still dealing with technological challenges, right? that are we there yet, sort of, in terms of uh, these precision technology uh, in small grain crops. Thinking uh, in terms of accuracy versus even speed of operation. Some of the technologies we have tried, they might be accurate, but the, the, the speed might not be there. And that's becoming uh, sort of a challenge uh, uh, recently, right? Because we know that uh, optimal planting time is critical uh, for, for winter wheat uh, uh, establishment, right? Uh, and with these uh, 
wet weather conditions, we have had challenges with harvesting and then planting the crop in time. Uh, there is interest uh, uh, among growers in terms of looking at uh, some faster planting technologies uh, that can get uh, a lot of area planted. We have seen a couple of years ago that we were not able to plant as much area under winter wheat as we would have liked. And uh, a delay in planting can cause uh, a yield potential decline too, right? So I'll, I'll come back to, to that uh, in, a, in a little bit here. Um, but to start uh, uh, with our results, uh, uh, the work we have been doing over the last few years, comparing planting with drill against uh, a precision planter. And you can see over here in terms of seeding depth, we are seeing a lot more uniformity when we go with the with the equipment that has a better depth control, so to speak, right? Compared to a drill where we are not seeing that. And we have seen a reduction of more than 30% in variability of seeding depth uh, when we go to a more precision planting system. But we have not seen that uh, much improvement in terms of seed spacing, less than 10% uh, reduction in, in, in variability. So again, speaks about the challenges uh, uh, with planting technology using uh, small grains. But this uh, Im improvement, at least in the, in the, in the seeding depth, uh, we believe is uh, helping us with improvement in yield potential, as you can see in our data that was collected from four site years uh, over the last few years, uh, that the planter was able to out yield our drill uh, by a significant margin, mainly coming from one year when the weather uh, seem to be more ideal uh, in terms of having more uniform seeding depth and availability of moisture later in the, in, in the growing season. What I was alluding to before, we also saw a benefit in terms of reduction in uh, warm uh, or dawn level, uh, at least in first year uh, at our mason plots, uh, as you can see in the, in the data over here. And we believe this is again going back to a more uniform crop stand that we were able to achieve using uh, our planter uh, instead of uh, a drill. So again, there are benefits here, but it might be weather dependent uh, and can change from, from field to field. We also wanted to go uh, and look beyond just a seven and a half inch standard row spacing, right? So uh, using our precision planter, we were able to achieve different row spacings. And here I'm showing a couple of uh, canopy uh, pictures uh, that's showing how much uh, canopy was closed. So in this picture in a seven and a half row inch spacing, you can see 76% canopy closure. So we are still not intercepting all the light, right? We are still uh, can see some uh, free space in here. Uh, and that was taken early in May. If you compare that to a 10 inch row spacing, we are about the same in terms of canopy closure. When you look at our 15 inch row spacing, now we are getting behind, as you can see. So we might be losing yield here, and we did see that in our results. But if you look at a five inch row spacing, we really gained in terms of canopy closure early in the growing season. And this ended up translating into a yield benefit, as you can see over here that our five inch row spacing did give us a significant yield improvement compared to other row spacings, including our standard seven and a half inch rows. But when we went to the 10 and 15 inch row spacing, uh, which some growers uh, already are doing uh, using their current equipment, you can see that there was a yield decline. So there are consequences of picking the optimal row spacing. And we believe going with the narrow row spacing does benefit. In terms of the seeding rate, uh, you can see we tried different uh, combinations all the way from half million to 2 million. And our break point seems to be right around uh, between one and a 1.5. We did not see a yield decline even by going to 1 million seeds uh, per acre. So there is a potential to reduce some of our seeding rates uh, without losing on the, on the yield potential, especially using these precision technologies. So now all of this work that we have done was done in small plots and it only compared a drill versus a planter. And as I alluded before, we have been hearing a lot of comments from growers about some other planting technologies, uh, including these uh, uh, more precision based drills, as well as uh, this new, uh, relatively new uh, 
thought process about broadcast incorporation of uh, winter wheat that can help uh, get more acres planted in a relatively short period of time. What it does is pretty much uh, uh, the idea is that you are using a spreader tool to spread or broadcast the seed and then coming back with a shallow tillage tool to sort of incorporate that. So we are achieving some sort of seeding depth. So we are looking at uh, comparing all of these planting technologies and these trials are done on farm uh, compared to the small plot work we have done before. And we are not looking at planting technologies, but even going beyond comparing multiple seeding rates with the idea being that the broadcast might be needing a higher seeding rate compared to our relatively lower rate in a, in a drill or especially in, in a precision planter. And we are also looking at tail versus no tail scenarios and collecting a lot of data on those aspects, not looking at yield, but also stand establishment, even quality in terms of impact on uh, some of those uh, dawn uh, levels and at the end of the day, uh, overall profitability, right? So this past year, uh, Dennis and I were able to recruit five uh, farmers actually four plus uh, a trial uh, at Bean and Beet Farm. So again, all of these trials are done at field scale. And in terms of planting method, we are looking at a minimum of a, a seed drill compared against some sort of a precision or a narrow row planting unit. And also including this idea about broadcast incorporation and using different till tillage as well as spreading tools that growers have at their disposal. Uh, and I'll show a little bit of data here, but uh, just keep, uh, uh, keep, keep in, the, in the loop and we will share some of this data as it becomes available. We are also doing uh, some more trials looking at uh, the impacts of seeding depth as well as optimal planting time and seeding rate. Uh, I will not talk about that today, but uh, again, we'll share that data after uh, the harvest season or please uh, send us uh, an email and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions for those aspects. In terms of the equipment we are using this year, you can see uh, again uh, with the two minimum comparisons we have had is uh, using uh, what we call our control uh, in terms of a seed drill and using uh, a more precision planter, uh, what we have used before the monosome unit and then comparing against the broadcast incorporation. And here you can see a couple of images of uh, tools that we have been using, different tillage tools, as well as a, a spreader to be able to uh, do a good job with that broadcast incorporation. So again, a lot of different ways to do this, but uh, uh, I can share some initial uh, images and data here, uh, but again, yield uh, data, we still do not have that. You can see in this image, uh, the drill plots is seven and a half inch row spacing, right? Uh, so you can see a nice row pattern in that canopy. These pictures were taken uh, last week here. Compared to the monosim, five inch. So again, a narrow row spacing. Uh, you can see that as well as another precision drill that we are using in five inch. And you can see this row pattern in all of these images. But if you compare against broadcast incorporation image here, you can see the lack of row spacing in this image. So this is all randomly distributed. And again, we'll see what are the consequences uh, on, on yield are with this method of planting. In terms of some initial data, here I'm showing you data from two different farms, seeding depth, but more importantly, the CV of depth, which pretty much means the variability. A higher CV means more variable uh, within that given plot. And as you can see from both of these uh, data points, the broadcast incorporation was able to at least be at that inch to inch and a quarter that we were targeting or a little bit deeper, but it was always more variable. So that's a concern we have at this point that there is more variability in terms of that seed placement. And that was pretty much evident across all the farms we, we tried this. And we also saw the the stand establishment was lower in, in these plots. So it, they can use a higher seeding rate and we'll see what the consequences are in terms of uh, yield. I used to think uh, uh, that this uh, cartoon uh, on the seed placement was the way to go. Uh, you can see that we are going with the precision planting, narrow row spacing at a low seeding rate, we are able to achieve more space between seeds. 
So there will be a higher benefit of a better seed placement, right? And I used to think the future is into robotics, you know, where we can even get away from this clumpy pattern of uh, rows, even narrow rows. But we can potentially achieve this using a, a broadcast uh, uh, method as well. But the concern is that seeding depth, right? Because we do not have a better control at that variable. And it might have consequences in a dry weather like this year if we, we do plant at, at a very shallow depth. So anyways, just to wrap it up, we are seeing that, uh, that keeping uh, optimal planting strategies are critical in setting us for a high yield potential, right? And early planting is a crucial point in there and faster planting technologies can help, but we need more research data to really validate and see a, a benefit or, or a negative of those technologies. But based on our work until now where we have data, we believe optimizing seeding depth is critical. Going with the narrow row spacing if possible is beneficial in terms of improving the yield potential. And then there is a potential for reduction in, in seeding rate without limiting our yield potential. So just a couple of uh, thought processes to keep in mind. And again, stay tuned for more data uh, as we harvest these trials. We have more of information available on our website, which is listed here. And I would like to thank uh, Michigan Wheat Program and Project Green and everybody else who has helped us uh, in collecting all of this data. And with that, back to you, Dave. Thank you, uh, Manny. Uh, and you do have a couple questions and we appreciate those questions coming in in the question and answer. So if you could get to them, we need to get a chance, Manny. And we need to keep moving on. So thanks again, Manny. And thanks again for those questions. Uh, now we'll go on to Marty Chilvers. And obviously uh, this is the time of year to be talking about disease management. So Manny or Manny, Marty, it's all yours. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so let's talk about uh, wheat diseases. Um, in general, it's been pretty quiet, right? Because of those um, cool conditions early and then dry conditions generally that we've been having across the state. One pretty um, unique exception to that is powdery mildew. Um, and it's a slightly unusual disease in that it's favored by these, um, you know, less rainfall, that lack of rainfall. Um, and so powdery mildew really thrives where we have these mild winters, cool and humid conditions uh, with dew formation um, and anything that might promote that such as susceptible varieties or excess nitrogen. Um, so Dennis sent me a couple of photos uh, a few weeks ago now or a month or so ago. And this really goes to de demonstrate the importance of variety selection. Um, and if you've obviously already made that you know, decision uh, back in the fall last year, and you're sort of stuck with what you've got, knowing your variety susceptibility is really important. And not only to powdery mildew, which happened to be the problem this year, but what is our risk for head scab? What is our risk to strike rust and other foliar diseases? What does that mean in terms of being actively managed, managing them this year? And so you can see uh, you know, a pretty stark difference here in varieties down the field there. Right, it's this um, variety with good resistance really keeping that disease at bay versus a variety that has uh, a lot more susceptibility to disease. And again, this goes for pretty much every disease really. I mean, variety is, is one of those key things for disease management, but then also just having an understanding of what, what we have and what we're working with in terms of susceptibility of what, what's currently out there. Um, another thing that another disease that has caused issue in the past um, has been stripe rust, right? We had that epidemic in 16 and that's where it, things got started very early, um, April, May, very sort of early start of May, where we started to see stripe rust move through. So each year uh, we as wheat pathologists across the US keep a track of where things are at. We have some national reporting and commentary type things that we communicate on and so we certainly been keeping an eye open for that disease. Um, and we had reports down south in April, but things have been very, very slow to move up north. Uh, I think Eric and Dennis's group um, identified some, uh, a very small amount of stripe rust out at the Mason Research Farm, but it, it's been pretty slow. And in Wisconsin, um, very early June here as well. So it's been slow. 
Um, those applications we make for head scab timing uh, will work very well uh, for stripe rust management, given how slow the disease has been to develop this particular season. And again, just a reminder, stripe rust typically we think about as moving from down south um, up this sort of corridor, right, um, to the north as the season progresses. Um, of course, the other one that's been on people's minds the last uh, couple of weeks has been head scab. Um, we're at least in this part of the state in, in central Michigan and southern Michigan, we're probably past you know, the application window now. Uh, but just as a quick reminder, you know, those spores are being released from particularly from corn residue, other grasses, but this fungus can also survive on soybean and dry bean roots. And it's, it's present in the environment. So even if you're doing everything you should be within a field, you know, planting into, um, not planting into corn, essentially, you know, there's still plenty of in risk um, regionally and spores can move in from other, other close locations. So this one's favored by warm and wet conditions. Um, it certainly has turned warm lately, um, but we've certainly had uh, very dry conditions overall. So we've been tracking the Fusarium risk tool. And essentially, you know, Michigan's been in that low risk category uh, for this whole period of flowering time. And a lot of this risk is, is you know, pretty heavily associated with uh, moisture um, and temperature too. But um, thankfully this season, it looks like, you know, um, we've been at very, very low risk for a fusarium head scab. Just in terms of the optimal fungicide timing here, and, and we may still have a window in some Northern locations yet, just how quickly things move and, and what we're really targeting here. So uh, we've done multi-state research to look at what is the optimal fungicide timing for these, these head scab applications. And really it's about a, a seven day window. So what we're looking at here is the beginning of flowering, 1051, where we've got flowers on 50% or more of the heads in the field. Um, and then that obviously moves through pretty quickly. Um, you know, we'll get full flowering on those heads. Uh, you know, flowers will begin at the, um, the bottom, move to the, in the middle rather, move to the top and then the bottom of that, what you know, individual heads. But then in terms of progression, you can see here, this is four days after 1051, the center image. And so you can see some of these anthers now um, are, are no longer productive, all the pollens come out of those. Uh, the white ones are, are old and dead essentially, and, but these yellow ones are where we still have um, you know, a live pollen in those, in those anthers. And that's when we're still susceptible or, or most susceptible to head scab infection. So really this, this window from the beginning of flowering to the end where we've got very, very few um, fresh anthers with, with pollen in them is, is around about that sort of weak window. And that's, that's our optimal timing for head scab management. Move outside of that window and the efficacy certainly drops off. So we do a lot of um, head scab trials on, on well, in, in various places, but we do a lot of trials to look at various chemistries. There's certainly new uh, chemistries coming to market at the moment or, or being developed. Uh, Miravis Ace is one of those newer ones. Uh, Prasara and Carumba are a couple of those older um, chemicals that we have. Fungicides are not magic bullets. So I want to point that out to start with, right? And so what we're looking at here is the amount of head scab in blue and how we're able to reduce that with Prasara, Carumba or Miravis Ace and also the associated vomit toxin, right? The, the amount of DOM, we're able to reduce it, but it's not going to eliminate our head scab. And this is in that optimal timing window. We certainly do look at other timings um, and that has been a question for Miravis Ace. Um, on the label there, it's got um, half head emergence, uh, 10, fix 10.3 as a potential um, application window, but the results here are a lot more variable than in that, uh, seven day window that we just talked about. So we certainly prefer to see you using that, that seven days from, from 10 to 5, 1. Um, in terms of fungicide efficacy, I don't have time to go through all the other diseases we look for, but we contribute this, um, this really nice table of multi-state data. And I'll put this um, link uh, in the comment section. Um, so this is a, a really nice fungicide table, looking at all the different products that are available um, and how they perform or how we rate those on various different diseases. So we've got powdery mildew, um, septoria, um, 
leaf blotch and you know um, head scab as well so really handy table to look at uh, it breaks them out and breaks out the modes of action that are included in, included in each of those different chemistries as well so um, something that my graduate student was looking at is what is the optimal timing and so we we collected data from from multiple studies to have a look at this and just what is the yield benefit to these different fungicide timings that that we we uh we look at and that we can think of them as generally sort of three broad timings that that t1 from fix five to six the t2 around that that flag leaf timing and then a t t3 being at that flowering window and so what what we did is compiled um, data from uh, Kurt Steinke, Martin Nagelkirk, and our trials to look at a lot of data points to try and get a better sense of what is the, the typical yield response when we look at this. So Michaela did a fantastic job at, at pulling through this, this data set. This is just sort of going into some of the details of the number of studies that we used, um, but an awful lot of different studies, uh, both from Saginaw uh, down through uh, to campus here. This is just plotting everything out. This is what we saw on average, right? From 195 um, uh, responses from 93 different studies. So a lot of positive uh, responses, but some negative as well. But what are the statistics behind this then? So again, looking at those sort of major timings, this is the, and I've, I've circled them in red here, the ones that we're sort of perhaps most interested in. So. I was a little bit surprised, I guess, by that four bushel bump at that T1 timing. And I do want to point out that this is the average, right? So this, this doesn't reflect every situation um, every year or for every variety. There's, there's certainly going to be variation. But on average, when we were putting those applications on at that T1 timing, we were seeing around about a four bushel response from that particular timing. Looking through to T2, a single T2 application, we're looking at just, just under seven bushels. A T3, which again is that heading flowering timing where we get the added benefit of also protecting flowers from head scab, we're up to nearly seven and a half bushel. And then one of the best combined timings, the T1, T3 was up to uh, 10 and a half bushels. So I thought that was really, really interesting data. And we'll be working on summarizing this in some additional extension outputs that are, that are coming out pretty soon. Uh, before I wrap up, one thing I did want to mention that we have had some issues with um, last year is dwarf bunt and common bunt or, or stinking smut. So this is where when we harvest the grain, it's got a fishy off odor and it's you don't really need, need much infected grain to have that very strong fishy smell, right? Um, and so this is a pretty big problem in terms of um, trying to market grain. Um, the fungus infects um, soon after germination of the seed in the fall and then grows systemically through the plant and then colonizes those, those seed as they develop and then basically replaces that seed with these, um, these bunted, bunted um, grains that, that'll open up and have um, spores inside of them. Um, unfortunately, these fungi can contaminate the soil um, and of course the grain as well. So it's important if we're thinking about saving seed to be scouting our fields very carefully. It is a little bit more difficult to identify than some others and you, you don't necessarily need a whole lot in a field to contaminate a seed lot. Um, here's some images of what that looks like. So we're looking at this sort of off colored right where again that those, those fungi are replacing the, the seed, the ovary themselves with those spore masses. Um, certainly something that's that's you know pretty easy to detect at harvest, but it may be somewhat difficult to detect um, scouting the wheat. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention um, as we get into um, harvest season here. Um, most seed treatments do a pretty good job, but you've got to have make sure we're really uniformly covering those seeds. Um, and yeah, you know, this is where using certified seed too helps to reduce the chance of introducing the disease uh, to a field because again, that those pathogens can survive in the soil for many years. And I'll leave it at that. Um, and again, thanks to Michigan Wheat for the support. Um, yeah, and we'll keep it moving. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marty. Very, uh, very timely and on time. So thank you much for that. And. Uh, check to see if there are any questions at the moment. I don't see any questions specifically for you. We will move on to kind of a different topic. Uh, 
Dennis Pennington is going to talk about harvesting high quality grain. Uh, we've had some requests from the end users uh, concerned about uh, the quality of some of the grain that's being delivered to the elevators. And so Dennis is going to try and give us some pointers on that. So turn it over to you, Dennis, the man who wears many hats for us. <laughs> All right, is my screen showing up correctly? Yes. Okay, all right, thanks. Well, yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, we wish we could have had a face-to-face -face field day and I promise we will next year. Um, but uh, this is the best we can do and we've got great specialists here at MSU that are doing a great job in, in getting good information out uh, to our growers. So thanks to all my colleagues and uh, the Plant Soil Microbial Sciences Department for all the good work you guys are doing. Um, I wanna just touch base quickly about uh, harvesting wheat uh, for uh, grain quality. Uh, one of the things that's important to remember is that wheat is milled directly into flour uh, and then made into food products directly. Uh, most of the wheat grown in Michigan is not fed to livestock. Um, that uh, then becomes a food product. So because our wheat is, is milled and then goes directly into food products, quality is of utmost importance. Um, all the way through the supply chain from the grower, through the, the grain elevators, the miller, um, and then the uh, end users that are uh, making the food products. So we all want to provide a wholesome, clean uh, food product. And one of the things that uh, we are hearing uh, from the, the food, well, it's coming from the consumers back to the, the food companies, is they absolutely do not want to buy product that was had glyphosate applied to it. So there, there are some places in the world where they use glyphosate to desiccate their wheat. Um, so that, that way they get the uh, more uniform dry down uh, of, of the grain crop. Uh, but there is nobody in Michigan that wants to buy grain um, that has been um, sprayed with glyphosate to, to desiccate it. So um, do not desiccate if at all possible. Um, make that a last resort. Another uh, quality is, is certainly affected by a number of different things. Um, most of these things are, are uh, components that uh, you guys all manage at different parts of the season. Um, vomitoxin is something that nobody really wants. Uh, that's caused by Fusarium head scab, uh, which Marty just uh, talked about. Uh, the way that you manage for vomitoxin is through variety selection and then um, fungicide application. Uh, the growth stage where we're at in Michigan, those management um, uh, practices have already been implemented. Um, uh, the wheat is all flowered in pretty much all of lower Michigan, maybe some of the very northern part of the lower peninsula. There might be some wheat that's just at flowering stage right now, but most of the, the wheat acres are already flowered. So we are beyond our, our uh, fungicide application timing for uh, vomitoxin. Uh, sprout is another thing. Um, you know, we, we certainly want to have um, high falling number or a uh, Hagberg falling numbers. Uh, we want that uh, starch to be in good condition. And so, um, you know, the way we manage that is through timely harvest uh, applications, as well as is variety selection. There are some varieties that, that tend to not sprout as bad as, as others, um, but certainly getting the combine in the field um, when the grain perhaps maybe is a little bit higher moisture and then drying it, as opposed to getting it down dry and then risking getting it rained on. Um, and then the moisture content goes up and then dries down and then gets rain on and, and whatnot. So that management is, is forthcoming um, as we get closer to harvest. Um, and high test weight is something, something we all strive for. You know, the heavier the grain, the, the, uh, you know, the more weight we have to sell, the, the higher the yield that we have. Um, and the millers are looking for high test weight grain as well. Um, and certainly the last thing, and, and this is related to in terms of management, uh, kind of how we combine and manage and store the grain. Um, and this is the amount of dockage in terms of like broken trunken kernels, unhusked kernels, green kernels, foreign materials, and, and, and so on. So disease management, Marty covered that very well. Just a reminder, fungicides provide suppression of diseases. Um, they're not necessarily uh, provide 100% control. So even though you have uh, made a fungicide application to control a disease does not mean you will not get it. Um, timely application is very important. Um, and because this, the fungicides are suppression only, uh, if you wait until you have the disease and decide to spray, 
um, you may not uh, get the outcome that you're looking for. And like Marty said, with the pottery mildew example, uh, plant resistant varieties, because there's a huge difference in, in the variety responses um, to, the, to these different uh, diseases. So one of the things that uh, we've noticed over the past few years is the amount of dockage seems to be going up and there's a number of different culprits um, in terms of the amount of dockage, um, including holes in the grain, um, and then unhushed kernels where the hull is still kind of wrapped around and attached to the grain, uh, green kernels, and then we're also getting some weed seeds in there. Um, for example, this wild oat. And the mills, before they make flour out of this, they have to remove that, uh, that foreign matter, the material that, that is, you know, you get charged as dockage when you take a load of grain to the elevator. So um, when we're thinking about grain harvest, we want to try to do everything that we can to reduce the amount of dockage that we get. Um, and that, that means not only timing of harvest, but also combine settings um, in terms of, you know, how to adjust your combine to make sure that you're getting a good, clean, quality grain um, harvested and put in the bin that you will then at some point deliver um, to the grain elevators. One thing that's important, make sure you have start out with clean equipment. Uh, make sure that all vessels that handle grain, including wagons, trucks, combines, augers, um, are free from dust and bird droppings, rodents, and old rotted grain. Um, ask questions and, and think about what did the truck haul last or what was the last thing that we ran through the auger? Um, is there anything that's been run through any of them that could possibly cause a contamination? Um, I was had a conversation with a, a food company here recently and um, they were they had a, a uh, train car that had wheat flour in that just had a little bit of wheat flour hung up in it um, and they put oat flour in it and hauled it to the uh, uh, their uh, manufacturing place and they ended up having a huge recall because they were advertising their product as you know gluten free and well with a little bit of uh, wheat in there um, they had to recall a whole product and it all came back to just having that one rail car that had a little bit of um, flour left in it. Um, so the same thing can happen uh, with, with trucks and, and, you know, any of the vessels that we use to handle grain. So make sure you have all of that equipment uh, cleaned up and in good shape, uh, ready for harvest. As, you, as you're preparing for harvest, uh, we tend to use yield monitors to help identify, um, uh, you know, areas of the field that uh, perform well. Plus, it gives us an idea how much grain we're harvesting. Uh, many of the different farms uh, conduct kind of on-farm field trials to test different varieties or different management practices or nitrogen rates or, or things like that. Um, if you're going to use your yield monitor to do that kind of thing, make sure you do a good job calibrating it. Um, you got to calibrate the, for the temperature sensor, uh, mass flow vibration, uh, there's a moisture sensor to calibrate, and then certainly the, um, the thing that uh, all of us, uh, you know, when we always think that yield is the most important thing, but we also have to calibrate these other things as well. Um, make sure your, your distance is properly calibrated. Um, your owner's manual will have um, specific instructions for how to calibrate each, each different type of the, uh, or combine has different methods. Um, and then use accurate equipment for the calibrations. When you weigh off the grain um, to verify, make sure those scales are in working order um, when, when you plug in those uh, calibrated weights. Um, then make sure each crop is calibrated every year. And then if you have high moisture and low moisture grain, um, make sure you, you calibrate once in the higher moisture and then do another calibration uh, once you get into the lower moisture uh, crop as well. In terms of combine adjustments, um, you know, most of this is just kind of common sense, and you you all probably know this, but um, it's it's always good to get a good uh, reminder. Um, make only one combine adjustment at a time. Uh, know why you're making it uh, before you make the adjustment, and then double check the result of the adjustment before making another. And when you're trying to adjust to get good, clean grain that's fully threshed, um, make sure you're operating the combine at full capacity. Don't run it slow and, and try to set your fan speed, your concave or your or your rotor um, speeds uh, and whatnot. Make sure you're running the combine at full capacity when you're making those um, adjustments. And then check your operation frequently, and especially when you, uh, ever crop, whenever crop conditions change, such as in a field where you change varieties um, or when you're going from one field to another. 
just keep an eye on it and make sure that your, your combine is set up to do um, and it's, it's getting a good clean sample um, or good clean grain um, in, the, in the bin. Um, in terms of real speed, set your real speed for between 10 and 25% faster than your ground speed. Um, adjust your ground speed to maximize the capacity of the machine. Uh, set your cleaning uh, fan speed um, so that you're blowing out the, the chaff and whatnot out the back and, and the holes from, from the grain. Um, set your sieves opening, uh, adjust your concave uh, settings, and then your rotor and cylinder speeds. Uh, and then make sure that you top and spread that straw the whole width. Uh, that is one of the things on our uh, uh, winter uh, uh, webinar series that we had. Uh, one of the things that was discussed was making sure to get this chaff spread the full width of our combine header. So adjust the chopper and, and the, the settings on the back of that combine so that you're distributing that residue the full width. Um, and this is true with soybeans too before you, or, or dry beans before you plant wheat uh, this fall uh, after harvest. So one of the things that we've noticed is, has been um, a challenge a little bit uh, coming into the mills is Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is a white wheat that um, threshes really hard uh, just to be real honest with you. And what happens is we're getting delivered some unhusked kernels into the mills. And so we were, we were looking at that and last year at harvest time, we had some Jupiter and some filler uh, plots um, at the Saginaw Valley Research and Extension Center. So what we did, um, we had enough plots. We, we kind of just set up a little experiment where we set three different uh, concave spacings and three different cylinders uh, speeds just to see what that would do to the, um, how well you could do getting um, these kernels husked fully or completely um, out of the uh, grain. And so uh, what we did, we had, uh, we had a three millimeter spacing on the concave, a five millimeter spacing, and then a seven millimeter spacing. And at each of those spacings, we ran the cylinder speed at 940 RPMs, 1140, and then 1340 uh, RPMs. And then uh, these bars that I'll show you in a minute, these are the percent of unhushed kernels um, in the samples. So what we did is we, we harvested, like say the first plot was, we set the cylinder at 940 RPMs with a concave setting of three. Um, and what we got was about th almost 30% unhushed kernels um, at that setting. When we increased the cylinder speed, 1140, that decreased a little bit. And then we went to 1340, it decreased even more. So the amount of unhusked kernels uh, with Jupiter, if you have Jupiter out there, set your cylinder speed higher. So what happens when we go to the, the wider uh, spacing? Well, the same kind of trend holds true. As we increase our cylinder speed, the amount of unhusked kernels decreases. And then when we go to even wider, so this, is, this spacing here is a little more than double the, of the three. Now, if you might be thinking to set that, that concave setting at three, it's like you're gonna slow down the throughput of your machine terribly and you're gonna have to go a lot slower. It's gonna take a lot more horsepower. Your acres per hour is gonna go down. Yeah, you're right. Um, um, so, but what, let, let's look at the, the numbers and what do they say? When, when you're at, you, so when you double your, your concave spacing, you're still getting that benefit of increasing your, your cylinder speed or your rotor speed. Um, so that's kind of the take home message. There was significant difference in increasing the cylinder speed. But if you look at the trends here, yeah, these, these seven millimeter concave settings are a little bit higher than, than the three, but they were not statistically different or statistically significant. So um, probably the more important thing is to increase that cylinder speed up um, compared to lower um, and, and maybe do something kind of middle of the road in terms of your concave spacing um, to get those Jupiter kernels uh, uh, completely husked. So that's about all I really had to talk about in terms of harvesting grain quality. Um, just a reminder, as we uh, go into harvest, um, make sure you you're, take the time to be safe. Um, that can be a busy time of year. It can be hot. Um, you know, when you're working outside like that and that dust and the chaff and, and the wind and whatnot, uh, and you're working really long hours, you can get tired. Um, just make sure that you and your employees are safe. Um, and, and I hope you have a, a good harvest. So with that, I'll wrap up, Dave. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, very timely topic. So, all right. Moving along, uh, we have Kurt Steinke, uh, 
talking about uh, not only wheat production, but straw production. So, uh, Kurt, we'll turn it over to you and uh, give you 15 minutes. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone is staying cool out there. We put together uh, two about uh, five or six minute videos uh, based on some of what we are seeing in the field thus far this year, both myself and one of our graduate students uh, in our program, Lacey Thomas. So I'm going to go ahead and run those. And uh, if we have time for questions afterwards, that'll be great. Otherwise, I will answer them um, in the chat. It's hard to believe we're headed down the home stretch of another winter wheat growing season. Looking at where the wheat is at right now, we're just at that flowering stage as you can see. One question I often get from growers is, what should I do from a nutrient standpoint in the autumn? It's never too early to start thinking about winter wheat planting time. September is right around the corner. So today I wanna to share with you a few tips of what to keep in mind from a nutrient standpoint with regards to wheat planting in the autumn. One of the first things to consider with regards to nutrient applications with winter wheat in the autumn is that you might be okay doing nothing at all. But before you do anything, make sure you get an up-to-date soil test. This should be the number one priority on your list. Now, that soil test may include a zero to eight inch and or a zero to 12 inch soil test. When you consider starter fertilizer applications in the autumn for winter wheat, the first thing to remember is that starter is a practice, not a product. The purpose of starter fertilizer is to give roots early access to nutrients. There are many reasons to consider using a starter fertilizer for wheat. I want you to take a look at the following picture. The picture on the left, you'll notice, is quite variable with regards to the overall wheat stand. The picture on the right is quite uniform. So again, this can be one of the reasons for using starter fertilizer in wheat is you can improve the uniformity of your wheat stand. That picture on the right, every plot has received starter fertilizer. The picture on the left, uh, every plot has not received starter fertilizer. There are also other reasons you might wanna consider using a starter fertilizer in winter wheat. One could be to stimulate early growth. This may or may not increase overall yield. Another could be to increase grain yield. Another could be for a little bit greater flexibility for side dressing, or in the case of wheat, your spring end application timing. Another could be micronutrient application. Can be a good time in the autumn. But remember, the focus of autumn starter fertilizer applications on winter wheat is to improve that start right capacity to capitalize on those mid-season environmental conditions. One of the hottest topics in nutrient management happens to be sulfur. Here we're looking at a plot that has received 25 units of sulfate sulfur applied in the fall, along with 100 units of N at green up in the springtime. Notice it does look like we see a little bit of a color response going on. We don't see that great of a difference with regards to row closure. Now compare this plot with the next one we're about to see. Now we're looking at a plot that's received about 30 pounds of N applied in the fall, along with about 25 pounds of sulfate sulfur applied in the fall. What do we notice? One, we notice row closure, much more dense of a wheat canopy. We notice a little bit of a height difference compared to the previous plot that we saw. Uh, we also know a little bit uh, of a difference with regards to color. Now the question you might be asking is why? One thing to keep in mind with regards to nitrogen and sulfur is that the more protein or sulfur bearing compounds produced through increased NNS supply, the greater the NNS requirement. This indirectly applies N to S ratio. So oftentimes when we apply a little bit of N, it may also be a smart move to apply a little bit of sulfur. So as we wrap up here today, we went over a couple different nutrients and there's a couple of take home points to remember. Where is that starting line with regards to what should I do if I wanna have one nutrient management practice in the fall on winter wheat? So first thing, nitrogen. Consider a pre-plant soil nitrate test. 
all right? That's typically a zero to 12 inch soil test that you can get prior to planting winter wheat in the fall. What we have noticed is when that pre-plant nitrate test comes back less than 10 parts per million, we tend to see a better likelihood of seeing a yield response to that autumn end application. With regards to the phosphorus, take a look at that zero to eight inch initial soil test and how that came back. Remember, with regards to the phosphorus, those critical levels are about 30 to 50 uh, parts, per million, parts per million with that Malik 3 phosphorus test. For those of you still on Bray, it would be about 25 to 40 parts per million. If you're in that range, you might be able to get away with just a maintenance application of phosphorus, which would be based on crop removal. Now, potassium can be a little bit different. If you're on a coarse textured soil, which is a CEC of five and under, that critical level for potassium is about 100 parts per million Malik 3K. If you're on a, a finer textured soil, which would be a CEC above five, that critical level becomes about 120 parts per million K. So those would be the two critical levels to keep in mind. Maintenance ranges for potassium would be about 100 to 130 for those coarse textured soils and about 120 to 170 parts per million for those finer textured soils. We also talked a little bit today about sulfur. Now, uh, something to consider with sulfur is we've seen positive and lack of response to autumn application of sulfur. Oftentimes, if you apply a little bit of N in the fall, you might want to consider a little bit of S application along with that. We talked about that N to S ratio. Uh, so we have seen some positive yield responses. Some of that may depend on winter precipitation in between the time of fall application and green up in the spring. So as we come to a close here today, one thing to remember is that if you want to have a great winter wheat stand and you want to have good yield numbers, you have to start right to finish well. All right, so that's one video that we put together. Let me uh, transition over here uh, to another one that Lacey Thomas, one of my master's students, uh, has put together. And uh, I'll get that fired up here in one second. Hi there, my name is Lacey Thomas. I'm a second year graduate student here at Michigan State University studying soil fertility and nutrient management under Dr. Kurt Steinke. Today we are taking a look at one of my wheat studies in which we are evaluating the impact of autumn starter fertilizer, spring nitrogen, and varietal stature on both wheat grain and straw production. In recent years, growers have had an increased interest on how to manipulate their inputs in order to increase grain yield, but also that straw component as well. To answer that question, we have set up a study in which we are evaluating three autumn starter fertilizer rates, three spring nitrogen rates, and taking into consider a tall and short soft red winter wheat variety to maximize both grain and straw yield. Located here in East Lansing, we have two varieties in which our short statured soft red winter wheat varieties flipper, known to have very good lodging resistance and good disease tolerance. On my left, and also the variety behind me, is Red Dragon, which is considered a tall statured variety, which most growers would select for straw that performs well in high management situations. The overwintering success of Michigan winter wheat can be reliant on the usage of autumn starter. In this study, we utilized a 1240 10% sulfur, 1% zinc product, also known as MEZ. This allows for early season plant uptake of various nutrients, tiller production, and early season plant growth. The three rates utilized in this study are zero pounds per acre, 125 pounds per acre, and 250 pounds per acre. In addition to this, the three rates of spring nitrogen applied at the time of green up would be a low spring nitrogen rate of 58 pounds per acre, 
a base spring nitrogen rate of 100 pounds per acre and a high spring nitrogen rate of 150 pounds per acre. Applied is 28%. Our efforts to determine the optimal relationship between autumn starter fertilizer and spring nitrogen are heavily reliant on pre-plant soil test levels. A pre-plant soil test of 0 to 8 inch composite in addition to a 0 to 12 inch nitrate test can be very helpful of determining where that starting line is. In this situation for the 2020 growing season, we had a pre-plant nitrate level of 3 to 3.5 ppm. Any nitrate level belief below 10 ppm results in a likely response to autumn starter. In addition to that, when evaluating our phosphorus level for this year, we have a phosphorus level of 35 ppm, which is right around that critical value that we would like to see of either 25 ppm Bray P1 or 33 ppm Malik. In addition to the likelihood of seeing a response from the nitrate added at the time of autumn starter, sulfur is a likely component of our response as well. It is important to understand that sulfur soil testing is not always a reliable indicator of what your current soil test levels are. In the past, additional research has demonstrated that an addition of 25 pounds per acre of sulfur applied either at fall or in the spring may be beneficial to your winter wheat crop. So far for this season, we have seen a significant increase in tiller production with greater tiller formation with high autumn starter as compared to low and no autumn starter in our tall variety red dragon. On the left, our no autumn starter base spring nitrogen plant demonstrates very few tillers produced going into spring green up. And again, this will carry throughout the remainder of the season. Moving to the center, our low autumn starter and base spring nitrogen rate has an increased number of tillers but is not quite as prevalent as our high starter base spring nitrogen rate here on the right. Here in East Lansing, we have reached F9 or flag leaf as of May 20th, in which the following treatment differences were recorded. Starting with our low spring N application of 50 pounds per acre, primary differences have been observed in canopy coverage, plant height, and color between our three autumn starter rates shown below. Moving on to our base spring nitrogen rate of 100 pounds per acre, we see very similar results with significantly greater row closure when comparing no autumn starter on the left to both low and high autumn starter on the right. Here we are also seeing some differences in plant architecture as the addition of autumn starter seems to be promoting greater plant height and therefore adjustments to flag leaf position. As we advance to our high spring nitrogen rate of 150 pounds per acre, the results remain consistent with greater coverage, plant height, and even darker color variation when observing the effects of autumn starter. For the 2020 growing season, autumn starter and spring nitrogen interacted to affect the grain yield of both our short statured flipper variety and tall statured red dragon. In flipper, the low starter high nitrogen treatment resulted in an increase of 31.4 bushels per acre with a 21.4 bushel per acre increase in red dragon as compared to the no starter high nitrogen treatment. In terms of straw, we viewed a similar interaction in which straw yield increased for flipper with the low starter low nitrogen treatment exceeding the yield of the no starter high nitrogen treatment. In addition, Straw yield increased in Red Dragon with low autumn starter and base nitrogen application exceeding the yield of no autumn starter and base nitrogen treatment. These results demonstrate a very key point in which the lack of autumn starter at the time of planting cannot be compensated for with higher applications of spring nitrogen. While our visual observations and current measurables appear to be setting the stage to reflect similar results for our 2021 growing season, it is important to take into consideration pre-plant soil test levels, planting conditions, and input economics before making decisions to apply any of these treatments. We look forward to sharing our 2021 results with you and appreciate your participation in Wheat Day for this year. Thank you.
All right, so that wraps up a couple of the uh, videos that we put together. Uh, just as a side note, we probably have uh, about another 12 or 14 different nutrient studies going on, both up in uh, Saginaw area and uh, near campus, uh, including some PGR work. And uh, we'll be sharing those results as we go through summer and early autumn. Uh, so I'll take some time uh, after I step off here and answer any questions that appear in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kurt. And, uh, and thanks to Lacey, too, for that video. So appreciate your comments. Now, moving on to Eric Olson, our wheat breeder, uh, with what he has for the latest news from Eric. So, Eric, take it away. Thank uh, you, Dave. It's great to be here today. And, and uh, I'm glad, uh, glad you all could make it. Um, and so we'll have a video in the field talking about some of our, our recent releases. Where it'll be uh, something of a history lesson on uh, some of the varieties that have been grown in Michigan as well. We'll look at some of the older varieties, as well as some of the new high-performing varieties that are coming out of our, our Michigan State uh, wheat breeding program. So Dennis has got a, a video he's uh, teeing up here for us. And I'll be happy to answer any questions in the chat. Um, during the video, too, I can type in any answers, and I'll be happy to take some questions at the end there. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you. It's a beautiful day at the Mason Re Wheat Research Farm. I'm Eric Olson. I'm a wheat breeder and geneticist here at Michigan State University. And the, the team and I, we uh, develop high yielding, disease resistant, soft red and soft white winter wheat for Michigan and the Great Lakes region. So I'd like to just give you some uh, a preview or uh, well, well, we'll do a little bit of re reflection on on the history of wheat breeding in Michigan here. Um, and then I can show you some of the new uh, the new releases that you uh, that you may be growing on your farm in a, in a few years here. Um, so years ago, you may have grown some Augusta. So, so years ago, uh, Michigan was predominantly soft white winter wheat. And, and hopefully you can see some of the progression um, in the agronomics uh, that are also related to increases in yield potential um, and improvements in wheat quality. Um, for for the state of Michigan. So Augusta, Augusta is a bit older. Um, you can see it's a bit taller, uh, later maturity. So one thing that's changed over time is the, the flowering date for these varieties. So so Augusta's uh, flowers about, a, about five day, five to uh, five to seven days later than, than most modern or current uh, current uh, soft winter wheat variety. So beautiful plant architecture. And so it's, uh, you know, uh, Frank uh, Augusta and, and Frank Frankenmuth that we'll see next uh, have been, they've really been, they've really been foundational to the soft white wheat uh, germplasm. You know, there's, it's a lot of the same, a lot of the same genetics that we find in Jupiter and Ambassador. Um, and and uh, of course, Whitetail is a Jupiter by Ambassador cross. So, um, you know, you do see a lot of these, you see these historical genetics represented in the, the varieties that we see today. Um, you know, and over time, we apply selection, uh, of course, for, for agronomics, yield potential, you know, really high test weight, um, and so on. But we also focus on um, scab resistance. And that's something that we've, I'll talk about some genetics where that uh, we've we've developed here that have uh, really, really taken the scab resistance to another level in this in, in this germplasm. So Frank and me with very similar uh, plant architecture um, to uh, this beautiful deep green color. Um, so this is, uh, this is Frank and me with, uh, held a lot of acres for a lot of years. Um, so, um, and, and again, these have been foundational in improving the genetics. So we're continuously improving, um, of course, the yield, you know, uh, but there are some other agronomic targets. Um, you can see there, they, these are a little bit floppy. We, as we, as we push that plant height down and select a little bit shorter, you don't always need a plant growth regulator to bring down your plant height. So you can do that by selecting shorter varieties. So we'll be able to, uh, we'll see that. Um, as we as we move through the history here, so Jewel was another another uh, soft white wheat. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, beautiful plant type here, uh, beautiful on variety. Uh, so that was that was around um, the late 1990s when when this when Jewel was released. So a few early, years earlier than that was Lowell, and you can see it's very similar plant arch very similar to uh, to Augusta in the plant architecture, a little bit taller. I mean, this is one you don't want to throttle the nitrogen on these. And in fact, that was the recommendation for this variety um, when it came out. Uh, huh. So 
Uh, good straw producer though, I mean, for, for a dual purpose. We, now you could see a dramatic drop. Uh, now Jupiter uh, was released around 2008, um, late late uh, 2000s there, and so um, big improvement in yield. Uh, very short plant architecture. So um, so the varieties we have are really. Um, the, the development of these, the agronomics of the varieties goes hand in hand with management practices. So we can actually push our yield potential a bit higher. Um, we can throttle the nitrogen a little bit more with these shorter plant, the shorter plant architecture. Um, and so Jupiter was a, um, an MSU line that was crossed with um, a New York line. And we introduced some uh, scab, uh, excuse me, some uh, stripe rust resistance in Jupiter. So there's an intermediate level of stripe rust resistance there. So, uh, so this is some of the history. Um, so with Jupiter, we've actually made, Jupiter, it's a very good combiner, and we've actually derived some very, very good progeny. And we'll see some of those um, from the, with the Jupiter background. Uh, another heirloom trial to my left here. Uh, you can see, you can really see the height difference here uh, with Jupiter. Now, now, let's pass our Jupiter border here. Um, so let's see. I'm actually gonna let's stay focused on soft white wheat here, and then we'll then we'll shift gears to talk about red wheat over there, R357. Uh, so when I talk about disease resistance, now there's and pro, scab is the number one uh, for us. So after yield potential, scab resistance is the second most important trait in our program. And one of the advances is uh, moving these traits into into the soft white winter wheat background. So it's a very the, the genetically they're very closely related. And if you don't have a trait in that gene pool, you got to bring it in there, and it takes time to do that to work on. Because once you bring a trait in, you can lose some of the other agronomic properties that you're interested in. W190 here is uh, the first the first soft white winter wheat with FHB1. So we have a large effect gene, FHB1, the FHB1 gene in the W190 background. And I'm, I'm excited uh, about this, very excited about this variety. So there, we're, um, so let's see, we foundation seed was planted last fall, so, uh, and then we'll have uh, certified seed production. So this should be available um, in 20, um, what will be 2020, uh, it'll be available for planting in fall of 2022. So 2023 crop year, we'll see the first crop of uh, W190. It doesn't get, it, it, the, the Don levels are extremely low, so the, so I want to make sure that uh, to emphasize this your scab resistance isn't specific to one market class so we do have in W190 we have scab resistance that is superior to the best scab resistance in any soft red winter wheat and I can say that with confidence it's it's an insurance policy now what you will be giving up is is about five bushels to some of the the higher end soft whites, um, you know, maybe your your Pioneer W W uh, W38 or Whitetail, for example. There is there's a modest difference. Um, it's an insurance policy. So what you're giving up in yield, you're gaining in scab resistance. And so, um, and I want to emphasize the best policy uh, for for managing scab is to first identify a resistant variety, and then uh, and then incorporate a fungicide management plan. The fungicide works, is the fungicide is most effective in uh, with when applied to a resistant variety. I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. It, it, it's the interaction between having a resistant variety and the fungicide applied. Um, and so fungicides are not 100% effective because they're preventing the initial infection. You know, the initial infection of that pathogen into into the spike, right? So that's that's kind of a that's the front door. Um, but with the genetic resistance, you may get infection one spikelet, but the the effectiveness of the genetic resistance is that it blocks spread. So generally, infection will happen at one spikelet, and and what the genetic resistance is doing is preventing the spread. So it might it might get in the front door, but it's not going to get past the foyer. I'm going to put it in that kind of context. So. Um, I encourage you, I encourage you to first identify your variety based on scab resistance and then incorporate your management plan the fungicide management plan on top of that if you have a susceptible variety that there's a risk in that um, 
I mean, you can manage that risk with, with your agronomic practices, of course. So, for W190, very exciting. So this should, we'll have some, uh, 2023 will be the first crop year where, where we see this produced. Now, boy, if this was a beauty contest, W133 would be the clear winner. I mean, this it's a gorgeous line. I'm, I'm infatuated with this line. It is, it's incredible. Um, good short plant architecture. Um, it's got a very long peduncle to it relative to some of the others. So it's an on variety. Um, you know, if you have a preference for uh, on versus on this, it's, a, it's an on variety, very high end yield potential. I mean, it is, it, uh, it, it is equal to or, or superior to, to whitetail in terms of its yield potential. And we got Jupiter represented in the pedigree there. Uh, so it's a, re it's a remarkable variety. It, it, um, we do have, it does have the Jupiter stripe rust resistance and there is an intermediate level of scab resistance in here. Um, so you don't, you don't see the high level of susceptibility. There is, there is a, uh, I'm not going to call it moderately resistant, uh, how, but I, it would fall into that moderately susceptible category where it is, it's, it's, um, the scab resistance is, is better than the, better than ambassador and then better than Jupiter. So it would be, um, but definitely not as good as, as W190 as we saw before, but it's a beautiful line. Um, we'll definitely respond to intensive management. Um, so, uh, so this one, this, uh, again, this went for uh, foundation seed production. This is, should be available through Michigan crop improvement association. And, uh, we should see, uh, certified seed available for planting in uh, fall of 2022 for this line. All right. Well, let's see who who do we want to talk about next here. Um, so we've got a lot of other experimental lines here. Um, you know, I can just talk briefly about some of these that are that, that um, these aren't necessarily um, these aren't ha haven't been uh, um, they're not commercially they haven't been commercialized yet. So we haven't seen any uh, there's any foundation seed being produced yet. But um, if you're in uh, um, you know soils that are um, lighter soils or um, what I'm getting at is drought tolerance for this line and it um, it performed extremely well um, those of you farming in 2018 remember how how um, how stressful um, 2018 was and we saw we saw a reduction in yield potential definitely in our in our trials but um, 528 does very well um, under under drought stress in those conditions R357 was in was the highest yielding soft red winter wheat in Michigan in 2020, and higher in the in the commercial trial. So, um, we 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 see it up to uh, 15 bushel yield advantage in some environments. Uh, does really well in more um, more northern environments. I think um, there's in part of that is due to the there is some moderate susceptibility to cephalosporium stripe that we have at, at the Mason location here. Um, so I think that that uh, handicapped it just a little bit. It's not a widespread pathogen. We don't see it causing issues. Where it does um, well is in uh, mid mid Michigan, mid to northern Michigan. So I think uh, Isabella, Gratchet, um, Montcalm, Clinton counties, um, even over into the red wheat part of Saginaw um, County, this line will will be very profitable. There's very high yield potential with this line. Um, and so we're looking at a, a Red Devil by Illinois line. This Illinois line is, is one of the foundational lines for the Illinois uh, program scab resistance. So we do see um, an intermediate level of scab resistance. It is, it's not as susceptible as some of the, um, some of the other lines that you, you may be growing. So there's, um, it's not. It's kind of right on the cusp. Moderately resistant, moderately susceptible. Um, we do see some susceptibility to um, to leaf rust and stripe rust, um, but we do have some good. It, it does appear to have some resistance to powdery mildew as well. Um, but I love this line. Very short plant, short architecture. Um, very upright, right? You, you, you do see um, differences in canopy architecture among these varieties that aren't necessarily related to yield potential. You, you do have varieties where that fill the canopy um, and you, 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 where you don't see any, any light uh, that, that reaches those leaves. Um, on the interior uh, between the rows and you see but you can see there's other varieties that, that in contrast are very upright you do see you see more upright flag leaves right you can see these these flag leaves are very have a very steep angle um, and what that allows is much more light penetration into the canopy um, that's another you know it's an open area of research that we're interested in um, how the interaction between um, canopy architecture and, and, and agronomy um, 
but you do see 357 is definitely much more upright. Um, it, it might look like you do have a smaller spike here, but there sure are a lot of them. So I mean, it's it's a, it's it's got some very high yield potential. So and this this line was is being commercialized by Michigan Crop Improvement Association. You should uh, again, foundation seed was planted last fall, so you should see some seed available. Um, you should have uh, certified seed available uh, for planting in fall of 2022. Well, I think that kind of wraps up uh, our, our plot tour today. Uh, thank you guys for stopping by uh, and um, feel free to, to, to email me or give a call with any questions. Or um, And so uh, thanks for being here today. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, it certainly is. Uh exciting to see these new varieties coming to, to the market. So really appreciate your, your hard work. And it's always nice to see your enthusiasm as you talk about all the, all the varieties as you bring them out. So thanks again, Eric. Thank, thank you, Dave. I appreciate all the support from Michigan Wheat Program and, and uh, appreciate the leadership from MSU to keep us going during, the, during this uh, difficult time. So everybody's been able to go to the field and the research keeps going. So MSU has done a great job there. Um, and just my, you know, to emphasize to all the growers, um, planting multiple varieties is a great way to spread your risk. So, and complement those traits. If you want to plant that racehorse variety for with that high yield, but is scab susceptible, plant that workhorse alongside it with that, with that scab resistance to spread your risk. So um, you can, you can spread, spread a lot of risk with planting multiple varieties. So thank you. Thank you again, and thank you to, to all the presenters today. Certainly helped make this a, hopefully a very successful, fruitful day for the, for the growers in Michigan. With that, I'll turn it back over, I think, to Jody Pollack Newsom and maybe Dennis Pennington. And uh, there, I know Jody is really kind of excited about announcements she's going to bring to your attention. So, Jody. And Dennis, I think I'll let Dennis start it off, and then uh, we'll get to the exciting news. All right. Um, is the correct video showing here or the correct screen? Yes. Okay. Um, we do have a couple videos that we will show as part of this. So um, as we go through this, if, if it's not showing up right or you're not getting your audio, let me know. In fact, actually, I've got to stop that because I got to make sure I, sh I check those to show the video, yep, which I did not do the first time. Okay. So there we go. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so we have been uh, working on a, a program here uh, over the last year or so, and uh, we want to share some information with you about that. So um, first, I want to give you a little bit of background on uh, a yield enhancement network. Uh, this is a concept that was started by some researchers at ADAS in the United Kingdom. Um, in the United Kingdom, they are very good growers of winter wheat. They do have a little bit different climate than us. Um, they can produce some very high yields. They have a longer growing season than we do, but they know an awful lot about wheat and how it grows and develops and how to manage it. And I think there's some things that we could learn from them. So they started what they called this serial yen uh, or yield enhancement network back in 2012. Um, and what this, this yield enhancement network, it's, it's designed to be a network with a few different components. Of it. One of the components is a yield contest. So one of the things they're trying to do is some on-farm research and they need to make sure they're getting good yield data uh, from, from the on-farm research to make sure that the decisions that they're making from that is, is you know, reliable uh, data and, and you can get um, consistent results. Um, in order to, to do this content or in order to do this network and do some of this on-farm research, not only are they doing this yield contest, but they are collecting a huge amount of data um, about the crop and how it grows so that they can benchmark um, different things and different applications and management practices to see how they're impacting the growth and development and yield of the crop. Um, they are reporting a, a huge amount of that data back to um, individual growers. So growers have information um, that, that they receive back to them uh, that they can use to see kind of where they are in the system and, uh, and learn a little bit more about how the crop is growing and developing and then how things change over time as they participate from year to year in this project. And then the third and kind of the last component here is a networking event um, where they get everybody together, they do announce the awards uh, in terms of the yield contest winners, but really 
one of the more important objectives of that networking meeting is to meet with uh, your agribusiness professionals, agronomists, uh, scientists, researchers, um, and other farmers to just discuss, you know, what have you tried on your farm? What worked? What didn't? Maybe there's something you know that somebody didn't know that you can share, and maybe you can learn something from somebody else. Um, to date, they have over 400 growers uh, in in their com or in their uh, yield enhancement network in the United Kingdom. And one of the things that they focus on is not just the actual yields, um, but also they focus on yield potential. And yield potential can be defined as the amount of sunlight or solar energy that's available to a crop, plus the total amount of water available in the soil and via rainfall. You add those two things together, and then how how good does the crop do at capturing those um, resources? And then how good is the crop at converting those resources into grain yield? So they, they do some of these calculations and determine what their yield potential is. And then also, uh, so they can compare, you know, what was the yield potential based on a given year, how much um, sunlight energy or solar radiation uh, was there, uh, how much available water, and then how good did that, or what, what is the kind of theoretical maximum yield, and then they compare that to what they actually achieved. So this yield enhancement network is something that has really improved um, wheat production um, in the United Kingdom uh, over the last uh, almost 10 years. Um, this is Dr. Roger Sylvester Bradley. He's the guy that uh, kind of had the, the brainstorm or the idea to put this network together. And I want to show you this quick little video here that he kind of explains what this network is about and why they created it. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share this uh, video with you. We're absolutely convinced that yields can go up if we just find the, the, the trick on each farm. I've been involved in the industry for 35 years and, and I think this is something that's new, really refreshing, uh, a, a different approach. Anything we can do to engage with farmers that brings new technology, innovative thought around productivity is, is absolutely right for us. I'm Roger Sylvester Bradley and I'm Head of Crop Performance with ADAS and in 2012 we started the Yield Enhancement Network or YEN. We've got this problem that yields are not increasing so the YEN is definitely about trying to see how farmers can do something different which will cause their yields to go up. I think what's special about YEN is the way that it looks at individual crops to try and find out what are the limiting factors for yield. It's looking at what actually is creating that yield and then looking at what can we learn in order to increase the yield of crops in a targeted way. It's really interesting the way ADAS have brought the industry together. So we've got an interesting mix of farmers, advisors and, and researchers all working together uh, towards the same aim. It really has been um, for the first time brought crop physiology and agronomy together. Farmers now are pursuing this, this idea of yield potential. It's what can we do with, with, with a particular site uh, and the problems associated with that site to improve things. And a, a lot of them are, are, are seeing it as a real education. I think what ADAS does very well is handle really what's quite a complicated volume of data, developing and evolving models uh, that, that are taking sort of you know, scientific understanding and research and applying those in a practical context. From a scientist's point of view, it's exciting for me because I can try and understand the thing I've been trying to understand all my career, which is productivity of crops, performance of crops. The benefit for us as a sponsor is you get more understanding of what's driving crops, what's driving performance, and it's a, a great networking tool. Basically, for us to make money, we need a large UK rapeseed crop. We're encouraged by the opportunities and what we're seeing so far. Globally, there is a potential to improve our understanding of how to increase crop production. If we can get trustworthy data coming from farms and being analysed by scientists in a rigorous and scholarly way. Jody, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Dennis. Um, 
You know, we've heard a lot about Yen. We were able to have uh, Dr. Pete Berry be part of our Wheat Wisdom webinars earlier this year. There was a lot of interest from growers. We had a lot of follow-up. Tell us more about that. How does that work? And, you know, there'd been a lot of looking around to see what's going on, what are opportunities. And I would say a lot to Dennis's credit, once we got him in this wheat specialist position and he started looking around to see what are the opportunities, a great conversation really evolved through a wheat workers group, which is the Great Lakes region, and really is um, spearheaded by Dennis, Michigan State. Uh, Martin Tegelkirk has been super involved with this group. A lot of our researchers presented this group. And the other big force in this wheat workers group is certainly Ontario. So that gave us the opportunity to be able to have conversations with Ontario. And really it was Michigan State, the Michigan Wheat Program, the Grain Farmers of Ontario, which would be like our counterpoint organization, uh, University of Guelph and the researchers that Dennis works with, and also the Ontario Ministry of Ag, Food and Rural Affairs. So those groups have been together talking for well over a year about what are ways we can work together. It seems we have so much the same when we look at climate. And then as the groups talked, really philosophically, we had a lot the same. We were all looking to see what we could do to help growers. So with that, Dennis, why don't you show us the next slide? Dennis and I are very excited to announce a Great Lakes Yield Enhancement Network. So this is the Michigan Wheat Program, Michigan State University, University of Guelph, the Grain Farmers of Ontario, and the Ontario Ministry of Ag, Food, and Rural Affairs. <clears throat> We've all come together, have been working on this. Uh, Dennis, certainly for well over a year, trying to get things pulled together. And we realized that we really have a lot in common. And as we look to what they've been able to do in the UK, it really makes sense to look at some cutting edge programs here in the US. Dennis will show us the group that's been involved with that. Um, this really is no small feat. These are just a, a quick snapshot of all the folks that have been in discussion talking about, can we do this? How would we do this? How does something like this come together? What is it that you need in Ontario? What is it that we need? And, and even everything down to how do you do the tests? What are the labs that look at the tests? All of this to make sure that we gather data that's going to be meaningful for all the growers in the Great Lakes region, from Michigan, Ohio, um, we've heard there's interest in Indiana, all the way through to Ontario. What can we do and how do we keep all these folks working together? So with that, we'll look at the next slide, Dennis. And... Um, really try to walk through. This is a very unique collaboration. Um, I have my little graphic kind of showing that we were trying to get our ducks all in a row to bring this out and to be ready to launch this. Uh, the original plans for launch were not until September, but in working with our partners, we said we want to be able to get this out to our growers at our field day. So what we're going to share with you is certainly not uh, all of the details, but uh, kind of a, a fun announcement of where we're at today, what has happened, uh, getting out in the field, looking at the crop differently, much as they do in the UK to see how do we hit that yield potential and really to share with you what the best minds we have in Michigan and Ontario have come up with as we have worked together over the last few months. So with that, Dennis, I will turn it back over to you and you can share some more details. Sure. So we currently have a pilot project going. Uh, we're kind of we started out calling it kind of a benchmarking program, uh, modeled similarly to um, what's going on in the UK. Um, so in the, for the 2021 crop year, or wheat crop year, um, we have 18 farms in Michigan, 23 in Ontario, and three in Ohio um, that are participating. Um, they are sharing all their data with us. We are collecting tissue, soil. Uh, samples and we will also be collecting yield component samples as well as grain sample um, at harvest. Um, this is kind of our test year to get the program organized, figure out how we're going to collect all the data, 
um, and uh, get our report generation um, kind of finalized. So we've learned a lot of things. There's a lot of things we want to do different when we actually launch this thing for real um, for this next crop season. Um, so these farms that are, um, you know, in this program here this year, um, they're in on the ground floor. Um, and and uh, so I, I think they're going to find that there's going to be a lot of benefit. I'd be really interested to to have a conversation with them and maybe have a, a, two or three of them talk a little bit about this project and what they learned about it uh, next year once we get um, kind of through this pilot project year. Um, one of the things, this is very data intensive. Um, we are collecting a wide range of data. Um, if you wanna know something about uh, your wheat crop and how it grows, um, this is a program for you because we are going to collect so much information and you'll have so much data reported back to you um, about your crop and how it grows and how it develops. What, are, what is the nutritional status of the plant? Um, what are your soil test levels? Um, yield components as well as your harvest uh, data. And um, we'll, we'll analyze the grain sample for um, nutrient uh, content so we can calculate nutrient removal rates. Um, we'll also calculate uh, and determine we're using the uh, NASA data set to estimate total amount of available water as well as solar radiation. We'll calculate your theoretical yield potential um, for the given year on your soil types and your fields um, and, uh, uh, and then tell you, you know, based on your, your entry in the yield contest part of it, um, you know, what percent of that yield potential did you achieve? And then are there things that, that with all this data that we're collecting, that we've identified that maybe can help improve uh, yield uh, and productivity uh, on, on your farm uh, as well. So one of the things that's a little bit unique about this, um, if you think about the National Wheat Yield Contest that we have here um, in the US, uh, they collect a bunch of the same data, but what they don't do is report that data back to the growers. Um, so th this benchmarking thing, what it does is, is that we use what's called a box plot and that's what this thing is. And so for every data point we collect, we, re we report back to each grower um, where they are in relation to it. So in this example, this grower, their number was 52. Um, and, and what these, these box plot represents is down here is what the lowest value of all the participants in the program are. This line in the middle of the box is what the middle value is. And then this is what the highest value for this given data point. And then the box represents the middle 50%. You might know who is in the contest or in the program, but you don't know who is down here. You don't know who is here. All you know is what the range of data is and where you fall for that given data point, um, which, which is kind of important for you to know. Um, so if, you're, if you've got something where you're down here on the bottom, you might say, you know, that might be an area that I want to look at. Um, we'll also give you some critical values. You know, you really should be above this point. Um, and then we might say, um, here's a benchmark or a target for you to try to hit um, as well. So you're going to get this data reported in this box plot format um, reported back to you. Um, and so here's an example of, of a sample report. Um, and here's an example of like the box plots. So this is the amount of estimated light energy captured, um, the percent of the annual total. So this person um, captured 45% of the total light energy. They were at the top of the middle 50% uh, of the growers. So they weren't out here, you know, somebody got almost 70% of the total um, annual light energy captured. This is the estimated amount of water captured. Um, this person captured 75% of the water, kind of in the middle of the pack, just a little above average of those that were entered in this. This is, um, thousand grains per meter squared, um, kind of middle of the road here. But so you're going to get about 90 of these different um, data points reported back to you. So you can see where you are in relation to everyone else. Um, this particular person, um, and this is actually a real entry from last year, I've blocked out the person. So and this is in the UK, um, by the way, um, they shared their data with me. So they got 10.7 tons per hectare, which is 144 bushels per acre. Um, they calculated their theoretical maximum potential at 20.9 tons per hectare, so they only achieved 51%. They calculated their theoretical maximum potential as 282 bushels per acre. Um, the amount of uh, water, um, they had 305 millimeters of, of water available in the soil, 100 and other 189 uh, millimeters via rain for a total of 494 millimeters, which is 19.5 inches. We actually get more than that here. So um, I think probably the, why they got, part of the reason they only got 51% 
of their potential is because maybe they were lacking a little bit in, in rainfall. But you'll get information back about uh, some of the different agronomy things in here. You can see they planted 1.2 million seeds per acre. Um, they put 206 pounds of nitrogen on. Um, they put three fungicides on and notice that cost here that 80 pounds per hectare, that's about $45 an acre um, for three fungicide passes. So um, they have some generics that, that uh, we don't necessarily have here. So their cost um, per acre is lower, but every person that participates is gonna get this kind of report back. Um, the report is somewhere around 60 pages long. Um, so there'll be a ton of information um, that, that is generated and, and reported back to you. So um, I got one other short little video I wanted to play just quickly here. Um, and this is a guy that uh, is participating from uh, the My UK. name is David Parsmore. I'm a mixed farmer from South Oxfordshire. Um, it's my first year involved in the YEM project. Um, we joined, well, I joined as sort of to continually keep developing my business, see what other people are doing that make some very good farmers and how we can benefit. And also by joining in my data sets involved, which makes the project more valuable. Um, it's really focused our attention to detail throughout the year, the information you've got to collect. Um, it really makes you think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what you should be doing. And then also the report we get at the end of the year is probably the most detailed analysis of a field crop I've ever seen. Um, and hopefully now we can use that to go forward next year to carry on improving. And also some of the findings out of that um, report and the Den Yen project, we're now using as part of tramline trials um, with ADAS to hopefully carry on learning and pushing yields up. So that's just a grower that's participating in, you can tell by the way he's talking, there's a lot of value that, that this project brings um, to his farm. So we're hoping that we are going to be able to bring the same value um, to your farms for our region, our, our wheat growing area um, of, of the world here. So Jody, I want to turn it back to you. And um, at some point you're going to want to share your screen. So you can tell me when you want me to stop. So if you want to go ahead and do that, I'm going to go ahead and show you, I, I think being the communications person, the next question always, where do I find more information? Hopefully everyone has seen this. This is our website, miweet.org. So you simply go to miweet.org. And if you look right over here on the side, Great Lakes Yen. And this website is hot off the press. It was just finished yesterday afternoon. So uh, go ahead, give it a look, take a look and see what you can see here on our website. We'll let that open up. This is what you're gonna see when you get to the Great Lakes Yen website. Just a quick overview of the program, why to get involved, the logos of all of the participants are in there. Probably the most important area for growers right now is going to be the frequently asked questions. And so you can just take a quick look. When will applications be accepted? It's just that easy. Click on the end and it will give you information. Starting July 5th, we are going to start accepting applications. If you want more information, you can certainly scroll through our FAQs and this will show you a whole lot more about the program. How do I apply? How many participants? What are the criteria? Is there a cost? Um, there is a cost for growers to participate. This was one of those discussions that we had as a group. Just the testing alone is well over $500 per farm. So there is a cost of $250 for each grower to participate. And you can see here all the different testing, all of those different kinds of things that are going to go on. And then if you have more questions, again, this FAQs document is gonna be very helpful. It is also going to be a place you'll wanna keep coming back to because this really still is evolving. We got as much done as we could, as quickly as we could. Uh, Dennis and I were working on communication stuff all weekend, um, got stuff back to Ontario. We had some back and forth. And like I said, a lot of this is just coming out today. If you wanna participate as a grower, there's an opportunity up here to give us your information, uh, put in your email address, give us your name. I can tell you someone already did that because I already got a notification 
that for the Michigan or the US side, uh, we have grower interest. So great resource out there for you that you're gonna wanna make sure you keep looking back. How do you participate? A quick about, just lots of information. And this will continue to grow as we continue to evolve the program and keep the program up and going and growing in the future. Um, I also want to make sure that I give you a quick update on where we are going in the future. Um, basically, we're looking at what steps are next. We need to continue our development of the program. Currently, this test has been Michigan and Ontario, developing the framework, the database, the reporting, um, all of those kinds of things. In the future, next year, we're looking at adding some more sites in Ohio. New York uh, folks have been interested. Indiana has some more interest. And we're definitely looking to involve agribusiness, crop cons uh, consultants, breeders, just really broaden that group that's really the brain power behind this. And the discussions that are held on our weekly calls are just outstanding as to what's happening with the weather what's happening with the crop, and what are some other things we should look at. So be watching for me more details in late 21 or early 22, because this is an evolution. And also, if you are in ag business, we will be looking to secure some sponsors and grow our network. This is an outstanding project, but this is a very, very expensive project uh, by the time you work through all the programs. So with that, um, I think that's a pretty good wrap up. I, I hope you are as excited as Dennis and I are on this. This uh, kind of feels like launching our baby. So much work and time and energy has gone into this. And major kudos to Dennis who brought the idea and a year ago said, let's do a test and see how this works. So with that, Dennis, I don't know if you have any more comments to add for this, but um Kudos to you because it was your brain power that said, I think we should get involved. Yeah, the, the only thing I would say is that uh, I think the, some of the real benefit of this is bringing more of a, a perspective, not just within Michigan, but more regionally um, than globally. And we do have our partners in the UK that are helping to advise us on this program and help us to generate these reports and, and get information back to the growers. And they'll also help us with our networking events. So by participating in this project, you're going to gain access to some really top-notch growers in the state. Um, as well as um, agribusiness as, as, and all the researchers um, and, and others uh, in Ontario. And uh, we'll have New York next year, Ohio, um, Wisconsin, um, and maybe some Illinois and Indiana growers as well. So, um, yeah, if you're interested, please go to that uh, Great Lakes Yen website. Uh, put, type your name or your email in, in there, and then that way we have your contact information. So that way we can uh, stay in touch with you. Uh, if we don't know that you're interested, uh, we somehow we got to know and, and get connected with you. So please use that form on that website that Jody showed you. But yeah, I don't have anything else, Jody. Great. I think then uh, I will go ahead and just turn it over to you. Um, I think everyone does know how to get a hold of me if you have questions. You got an email from me with the link for the Zoom. So if you have questions or need more information, please feel free to follow up. And I also should mention, if you've not signed up for our new newsletter uh, from our website, because every month when we do an issue, we will bring you updates on uh, the Great Lakes Yen. So that will be a, a main vehicle we use to get information out. So with that, Dennis, I'm going to sign off and turn it over to you because I think you have some folks that want some credits. Yes. Um, so we do have, um, there are a couple more questions um, in the uh, Q&A, and we will answer those um, and get those back to you uh, before we close the meeting. Um, I did just plug in to the um, chat box. So if you look in, in your screen on the bottom in the middle there, there's a uh, chat button. If you tap on that, um, I just plugged in a link. Um, this link will take you to the survey. Um, this is just like the webinar series that we did. You, you go to that uh, webinar or go to that uh, link and it'll walk you through plugging in your information um, to get your RUP credits. We have two RUP credits for today and two CCA credits. Um, the QR code for the CCA credits is in there. Um, so if you use the app, 
to get your CPA credits, you'll be able to pick a picture of it um, to, to get those credits entered, or um, you just fill out the, your name and information there and we'll get it submitted uh, for you. So make sure before you close out a Zoom here that you click on that link and, and go fill out that uh, form. Um, it's the MSU Qualtrics uh, form again. It's, it's very, very similar to what we did for the uh, webinar series. So um, with that, uh, I don't know that I have any other comments. Uh, if anybody has any questions, keep typing them into the Q&A. Um, we do need to get wrapped up and closed here. So what we'll do is we'll uh, publish the, the questions and the answers in the next newsletter. So Dave, I think I can turn it back to you to get things wrapped up and closed up. Jody, you're on mute. Dennis, Dave actually is chairing another meeting that started at 10 via sure. Zoom. So um, yes, I just it. want to, to all of the specialists that participated, and for the growers, we really appreciate it. We had almost 200 sign up to be on today for the webinar. We look forward to seeing you in the future in person. And I am pretty sure our annual meeting that we're working on for next winter is going to carry a lot of information and updates on the Great Lakes Yen, what's happening next, what did we find through the first year. So stay tuned, watch the newsletter. And again, thank you all so much for being part of this today. We will leave this open a while so you can get the link to do the survey. And as always, if you need anything else, let us know and happy harvest.